Star Wars Squadrons, The Mandalorian, and Need for Speed Hot Pursuit Remastered. This is staying in. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New... Happy, Happy New Year. New Year. That was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> to thrust us into a little bit of self-indulgence for a second, I listened back to our first show of 2020, just to remember what the world was like, really. And for some reason, whether it's precognition or just general ignorance on our part, we actually, it was only me, Pete and Dan on that show. And we actually did, for some reason, joke about the fact that Chris might be the only one of us who actually makes it into 2020. And Chris, and we also said verbatim, Chris has quarantined himself from the virus. Huh. huh. So are you saying that we are pod zero? Oh, we're something. I, mean, I don't know if I like I mean, this. What can I say? I'm a man, I'm a man who's ahead of the times. <laughs> so we are soothsayers. Uh, I feel well. We're more Yuri Geller than no. I, no, I, I'd, 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 I'd go one lower than Pete. That Pete, I think I'm more like the octopus that was predicting the football results. Oh yeah, well, he was very good though. Yeah, the octopus oh, got right. it right a couple of times. Yeah, every time, every single time, he was never wrong. the The other thing we predicted was that Pete would finish Final Fantasy twelve. Yep. Did you did you did you do that? I did. Okay. Uh, uh, you, you said then that you, then now you once you completed it you'd be able to talk about it. So do you want to talk talk about it? Yep. Um, <laughs> so the makers of Final Fantasy twelve sure watched Star Wars the uh, the new series, uh, not the new new series, the old new series, the new series that was new when Final Fantasy twelve was new. Uh, so not a New Hope, but uh, Phantom Menace. You mean the prequels? Uh, sure, the prequels. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, yeah, if you want to, if you want to really get to the heart of the matter, uh, they watched the prequels and then based their entire visual design around it and very, and quite large chunks of the story. Uh, it was fine. Maybe not worth 70 hours, but I listened to a lot of audiobooks. So that was good. Yeah, that's good. Have you, have you, have you got any bold resolutions for this year now? What for audiobooks or for, what, what, for just 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 in general? Just cause... in general, I'm going to publish an RPG supplement. Really? Yeah, I'm going to do that this year. Yeah, huh. I uh, I've been I've been working on stuff all of this year, and as I've sort of been going on about, and I think this year I'm going to go ahead and just do it because I've got a good idea for a little solo RPG. And I know Chris, you've been working on one as well, and I feel uh -huh, yeah. I feel like part of a little creative group. Mm. What were the Chris would know? What are, what were the what were the like fancy French creative groups of like the eighteen nineteen hundreds? You know the the ones where they go to a what cafe. What you mean like? And... I mean I mean like the bow. You got like the Bauhaus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which yeah. is German, but okay. Yeah. What were the French ones? They would go to like cafes and then talk about politics. Le Bauhaus. And, and art. Oh, Le Bauhaus. <laughs> <laughs> got everything from like dada the symbolists right. the surrealists yeah yeah mm. so all of that i feel like we're in one of those you and me chris what like some kind of salon a literary salon we're in an rpg salon yeah we're working on our, our own things so i'm gonna do that and uh this is the one that i will is more along the lines of the final fantasy 12 will he won't he he probably won't but maybe he will uh, i'm gonna finish painting all of my miniatures what? Oh my god! I mean, I think you're over. I think you're overestimating the investment that our audience may have in the past year. They've been waiting for this episode to find out will he won't he complete Final Fantasy twelve? <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine if like if if like if someone's listening and, and going like, oh, finally, finally, you can talk about it. <laughs> Who shot Jr. Um, did he complete? Final it's Fantasy been 12? on my Amazon wish list for a for a year now. I needed to know whether or not that very famous video game was worth purchasing on the Nintendo Switch. And it turns out, Jerry, it is. So tune in this time next year to find yep. out if Pete does complete yeah. <laughs> painting all of his miniatures. Yeah. Jerry's kicking himself like, I can't, I can't handle it. With you and your miniatures, I kind of see it like, like a San Francisco bridge kind of situation where... Yes, you'll get to the end of all your miniatures, but over the course of the year, you'll have bought so many more that you'll have just as many to paint by the end of the year. So that's that's the promise to myself. I'm not going to buy 
any more until I finish the ones that I mm. have. Hmm. Yeah, yeah no, but, I know. Yeah, but you sit there on Board Game Geek and you just, your eyes wander across a page. Suddenly, what's that? Ooh. Oh, Ooh. also, you're underestimating the, the sabotaging nature of the other three people on this call. <laughs> <laughs> I've managed to uh, find a new contender for my favourite PSVR game. Uh, so for a long time, the, the the best PSVR game I've been playing has been, as I mentioned last uh, last episode, um, Astro's Rescue Mission, um, which is just fantastic. Mm. But um, a game came out recently, which I was really not sure about, but I'm really, really impressed with, which is Star Wars Squadrons. Right. So Star Wars Squadrons is a basically a flight simulator and i've never played flight simulators but this had got great reviews so i thought i'd give it a go i was really worried about motion sickness because having played certain games like white pants for that i had suffered with motion sickness i thought putting me in a space fighter is not going to make me feel good but i managed to find a good price sam taught me about a grift that i could use which enabled me to get it at minimum risk so i started playing that and it's really, really good. The flight sim element works really well. I've not really experienced motion sickness, but it does the thing that VR, I think, does best in terms of immersing you in an environment and kind of putting you in, in contextually the, the kind of the location. And the best way it does is because basically the game is split up between two characters. It's uh, a rebel fighter and um, an empire fighter so you you the story flits between two and you play them at different different positions um and there's kind of treachery and backstabbing and all all this all this good stuff um and so the game is split between these two um missions two sets of missions where you're in different fighters the different fighters look different but there's very little in terms of heads up display as you would typically expect in a normal game in the top corner you've got your health set in there you've got a map at the bottom all this stuff is kind of been printed on the screen as you expect with kind of video games and there is you can have more of that if you want it but a lot of what they do is they build all those elements into the console of the ship that you're working on so for example mm. if you're in a ship uh you flick between your your guns your lasers uh your speed and maybe the control of your ship but rather than having like icons and stuff like that, you have kind of a group of small lights on the side. And as you press it, those flip between red, green, and blue. So as soon as you're taught that, that just becomes something you spot on your console. It's not something that's flagged up, but it all fits brilliantly within the console. You do get that feeling of being in a cockpit. Um, it would be, I think you can, not obviously not with a PSVR, probably with an Oculus, stuff like that, you can, I think you can get kind of flight sticks and stuff, which would be really, because obviously you've, you're adding into that kind of immersiveness then of using those controllers. But I've really just enjoyed that immersive experience of being sat in this cockpit and feeling like I'm in a cockpit and understanding controls because they're contextual in the, in the environment that you are and they're not just press square to do mm. this press x to do this you're taught it at the start and say okay well you press a certain button and these will flick between the different ones and from then on because it's all really nicely laid out you remember that and you remember oh yeah okay so that's there that's at four so i know that's quite high and it's on the lasers so i can shoot all that stuff and it works really really well the the controls in terms of moving around in terms of your flight the flight sim aspect has taken me a bit of getting used to because I don't know flight sims. It's not something I've played a lot of in the past. So the whole thing of tur like turning upside down and swinging around and all that stuff has been tricky, but I'm, I'm getting used to it now. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't caused me any kind of motion sickness, which I was concerned about. But I just it's it's the first game I've played. Um, I've played there are, there are plenty of other good VR games, but it's the first one that's made that's kind of come close to what kind of Astro's Rescue Mission did. They're like poles apart in terms of types of games, but the way it kind of brings in what VR can do is has just been fantastic and I've really, really enjoyed it. So in terms of, because um, I've just been looking at gameplay of it, because I, I must admit I've, I've not really been keeping on top of it. Having a look at this gameplay, it looks a little bit uh like light in terms of the simulation like how how like how simulation e is it is, are we talking about something that's like microsoft flight simulator where you know what pete wants to know is before you take off do you have to request permission from grand high command yeah it's yeah it's like how much of a simulation of flying an x-wing is it is it like 
So, for example, in X Wing versus Tie Fighter, because these do exist, don't they? X Wing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, okay, sure, but like, but for example, in uh, the game X Wing versus Tie Fighter, um, you have to um, equal out, equalize out energy loads. You put more energy into the engine, more energy into the weapons, that kind of thing. Elite Dangerous is another example where there's actually quite a lot of like it feels like a simulation of whatever the, it is that you're actually doing in this sort of sci-fi space. Is it more along those lines, or is it more along the lines of uh, was it Rogue Squadron on the yeah. GameCube, the one <laughs> that still looks absolutely amazing when you go back to it now? Um, is it more like arcadey or? I, I would say it is probably on the more on the arcadey side. You can when when you're playing it, obviously you're you're hunting down other ships, you're shooting down other ships, and you do have kind of heads up kind of guidance on that in terms of looking around and being able to give you uh, indications of where people are. That can be turned off as well if you just want it to be a pure experience. You can turn off any kind of assistance that you want. Um, I can't really talk so much about its comparison to like a full simulator because i just don't play those games but there's not i think a lot of the stuff you're talking about that there is a stuff where you're you're flitting between assigning the different engines to different parts of the ship so there is those elements um and as i say those are very contextual in that environment as opposed to just something that's mm. kind of pinpointed on your screen but i would say i think the i think the telling fact is the fact that I was having to pick it up so quickly tells me it's more arcadey than it is full sim. It would take if it was a full sim, I imagine it would take me significantly longer to get into it. And mm. I managed to get into it fairly quickly. It took me a while to kind of get to grips with controlling the ship in kind of up, down, left, right, going backwards. Suddenly I'm upside down and trying to because obviously from the you're always looking from a first person viewpoint. You're not you're not coming from like a third person outside of the ship. So it does take some getting used to, and that's the only thing I've really struggled with. Um, mm. I've whacked it down onto easy because there's there's too many obstacles for it anyway for me that I don't want to have to worry about it being unhard and being shot down all the time. One shot and you just blow up the Death Star. Yeah. Exactly, that's not good <laughs> fun for me. But yeah, so I, I would I would say it kind of falls more on the arcadey side. What are you flying, Dan? What, what kind of ships are we talking? X wings, Y wings? Uh, it is an X wing. It's I, I mean it's the X wing and it's the one with the curved sides on the the bad guys side. I I, I, I mean fighters? I. Is that the type? Yeah, the type. So yeah, so Tie Fighters and X Wings are the, are the ones that they are. It do, it does have the does it uh, does it not have it does have the stuff in it though where you can control where the power of the the engine is going, doesn't it? Yeah, so I mean maybe yeah, so that's that's the stuff where I talk about where you've got the different lights on the console where you can s apply the energy to the lasers or to the speed or to the controls, and that's where you can do that. And you you press buttons and that will flick between the three, but it's not a case of you have selected lasers. It'll just the little light yeah. will change from green and it'll flick over to the red one and it'll flick over to the blue one that's the only indication that you have it's it's so funny in in 2020 i tried to a couple of times get into elite dangerous on the playstation and i really liked what i could see the game would be like to play if i was halfway competent but i never got to the stage where i was because that is a game where you're saying where you are asking for clearance to to take off and land and like you are doing like trading and um, like lots more there's much more finickety bits like you know like the the way that your ship handles is very different depending on like what upgrades you do and what you're carrying and all that kind of stuff and lots of different heads up displays and i wonder like what is is that is the appeal of squadrons is it is it that it's star wars and it's fun and it's is it the is the appeal that it's star wars is the appeal that it's a good vr game or is it the or is the appeal that it's a fun flight combat game? Like what what was it that dragged you towards it? I would say, uh, I mean, in terms of the, the, why the game is good, it's all three of those things. Um, what what drew me towards it was mainly kind of looking at the reviews because typically a Star Wars flight sim, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have gravitated towards just because I don't play flight sims. I like Star Wars. I like I've played Star Wars games in the past. Um, mm. I think Rebel Assault way back in the day on PC would have been the game that I I most ever I most played, um, and that was a, that was a long 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 time ago. Yeah, and yeah, I've, I'm I'm a big fan of the series and all that stuff. So that was all that interested me. But I've found with kind of VR games, they kind of they can be hit and miss. And so when this was coming out with really good reviews, I I saw that they could get it at a, at a price that was good and all, all of that. I was like, I'll I'll give this a go. Um, because it's meeting a number of requirements. It's it's put it's a type of game I wouldn't usually play. So so why not try that? Um, and I'm really glad I have because it has um, opened me up to a different. It's not something I'm not going to go and buy Microsoft Flight Simulator now and spend the rest of my days Ooh. just flying over the ocean. 
buy it. <laughs> no. Thing is, the thing is, it's something like Flight Simulator, Pete. Yeah. The idea of it. Yeah. Really interests me. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Really yeah. interests me. But yeah. I also I know myself, and that right. interest after a very short period of time yeah. will wane, and I yeah. will get bored, and I'll be like, okay, now I want to do the fun stuff, and the fun right. stuff isn't just flying from A to B. No. The fun stuff is I want to try and do a donut in the air, and that's not yeah. something that the game's going to let me do. Yeah. Can you imagine how difficult it must be to be an actual airline pilot to have to keep resisting that temptation? <laughs> <laughs> what, just to do a barrel roll? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think the co-pilots are like everyone? That's what they're what? there for, Pete. Is to keep them in check. Do Do you think? Do you Do you think they have one flight where it's just like on their training? It's just like. Get it all out of your system, Steve. Yeah. You've got one yeah. flight where you can just, you know, do what you want. Get it all out of your system. It's like the, the airline flip. version of the purge, like yeah. once a year. <laughs> Look, this 747 is getting repaired in a couple of days' time. Just whip it round and uh, have a quick go on it. But yeah, I know myself too well to 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 go for that. As 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 fascinating as I think it would be, it'd be like if mm. if they still kind of did the. I'll go to the shop and I'll rent a game for like three days for Fiverr. Yeah. If they did that, then maybe because I'd be able to get all everything I want from the game out of it, and then I could just give it back without any kind of that's why impact. That's that's the thing. That's why you got to go all in. You got to buy a flight stick. You got to buy flight pedals. <laughs> you got to buy all that stuff so that you always play it because you're like, well, I've spent four hundred quid now, so I better play this bloody game. <laughs> What about well, what about you, Dan? Have you got any uh, have you got any New Year's resolutions? I, I, I do actually. My New Year's resolution is the kind of the very boring one that everyone has, but I've never actually had because it was a really boring one, and that's just the idea of getting healthy and getting fit and stuff like that. Because mm. the year as it's gone, uh, with lockdown being at home, I'm walking around just less. I'm in the house more. I tend to be eating more. I have a baby, so it's just kind of. Are falling as we as we found it in the last episode where I, sat, I was sat there looking at an article about ladders. I'm in a bit of a rut, so <laughs> my New Year's resolution is to get me out of said rut. Uh, and so yeah, from from first January, I'm going to start exercising again, um, eating better, and just just looking after myself a bit more. So that's the boring one, but I've never actually had that as a resolution. What are you going to do though? Like you're going to like strict regime of food and, and exercise. Yeah, Dan. Because if your body's a t if your body's a temple, what what kind of how has what's that temple looking like, and what do you want it to look like? I imagine it. I imagine it to be like uh, a, a church uh, out in nature where everyone is very quiet. <laughs> everyone is meditating. Um, I'm I'm pulling yeah. this off of my head. I don't even know what any of this means. Um, Full of but old you've asked people. me to, you've asked me to say it, and here I am on a microphone. I've got to say something. So here we go. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm going mm. with. Yeah. So imagine like. Uh, a meditative yoga retreat that's that's the equivalent of where i want to be in actual terms i'm going to eat a bit better i'm going to go for some runs that's that's mm. the practical version mm. of it but symbolically i'm on a yoga retreat i mean just go on a yoga retreat yeah they're great <laughs> it's cheaper to just run that run around the park down the road though Hmm. I mean, I've done a bit of yoga. I've not done a lot, but there wasn't that much running in it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think there's two different things there. The, they're in both. Yes, they're both form, forms of exercise, but they're both achieving very different goals. I would like to focus in on the the lack of preparation I was offered in terms of this rather complex metaphorical uh, question I was asked. How, how many episodes of this podcast have you done, Dan? Did you? Know? <laughs> I think you've done admirably. What about you, Sam? Are you going to... Uh... I'm just going to learn how to crack an egg with one hand. No. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> I have done that in the past. I have done that on occasion. I've, I've always wanted to do it. I've always come close, but never committed to it. Because I'm just what? like, mm, this could ruin a good poached egg here. <sighs> Do we need to do we need to tap in Sarah on this? <laughs> I think we should I think we need to drop Sarah an email. Yeah, cancel. Really. Um yeah. yeah, so that that is that is my resolution for the year. And I, I have got a supplementary one, which is to, <laughs> which is for one lunch out of every week not to be a sandwich. Okay. Yep, yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Like cut down the bread. Well not really that. It's just like kind of I have a sandwich and pack of crisps for my lunch, pretty much, and I have done for the last probably twenty years. Yeah. So, yeah, 
um so like i just think of it as a way of it's the same thing that i do i use lent not for uh, secular reasons but as a general like defined period of time to try something new and force myself into in developing a new habit so my that so that's what i'm doing with this resolution is kind of like mm. i'm gonna i'm not gonna be like I can't have any sandwiches for lunch, but just one, if I can make one lunch every week, not be a sandwich, yeah. then You've I feel it. like that's uh, that's a good resolution that I, I know I can stick to. Chris, resolution. Gosh, wow, unexpected. Uh, <laughs> I, I usually say, I usually say every year as a joke, mm. staying alive. Mm. All right. Yeah, I usually but, say that's a resolution. Now, yeah. But now, but now, mm. yeah. I want to get a book chapter published next year. A oh, book okay. chapter. A book chapter. Yes. Oh. I mean, I'm slightly um, stacking the deck in my favour because I have a chapter with a publisher as I speak, <laughs> but it's been delayed so significantly. In, the... in a previous year, uh, my own resolution was having a child, and I was on the verge of having said child anyway. So there's nothing wrong can, with that can, yeah. can we also can we also uh just define that this this is an academic chapter and this is not like some weird publisher who is just like commissioning you chapter by chapter to write this great mystery fictional novel Pip, chris isn't guest guest writing one of the chapters in the next game of thrones <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no doing that um for the last year and a half or so dan and i have been trying to make our way from the from bag end to the equivalent of Mordor. We've measured out those miles. Dan is currently ahead of me. I'm trying to run the distance. And in the last year and a half, I've just made it to Moria from the Shire. It is a long... They walk... I tell you what, lads. They walked quite a distance. Mm. How, how do you know how far they walked? It never... It never... It, it, the, the chapters... From my recollection... It's been a long time since I read The Lord of the Rings, but from my recollection, chapters don't start. Day 43, 4,337 miles. In the Big Brother house. <laughs> don't, don't you remember that fifth hobbit that had like that trundle meter? That, which... <laughs> like Alex <laughs> Horn in Taskmaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a tape measure behind. Um, no, so somebody, because obviously Tolkien put like lots of maps in there mm. and somebody has kind of looked at things such as the map, the scale of the map, the days in terms of because there's in the in the appendices there's the kind of the diary of how where they got to when and working out roughly the miles it would have taken them to get there so i put that into a google drive table and dan and i are contributing to that really so it's been quite interesting like just a literary journey mapped onto essentially my running route but yeah i, I want to, i don't know what i want to achieve with that because it's taken me only a year and a half to get to what essentially is halfway through the first film so uh yeah, yeah but those getting... extended cuts are pretty long aren't they so. <laughs> yeah so we'll see i'd like to get to the end of the fellowship of the ring um by running please uh <laughs> if that makes sense and and, and actually no there's a third thing that's geeky i want to run an rpg so i've seen you know i've you know i've learned from the best i've seen everyone else here run an rpg i've not had to go it myself and i found one i quite like the look of so i'm gonna do some research into that i'd like to run one before the end of the year please and and just to be clear again, that's different from running the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna literally run on the spot when I am. <laughs> We're not lapping. So I've been a bit strange, really. I've been watch. I've been trying to get work my way through Disney Plus's stuff, mostly the Star <laughs> Wars stuff. Why, why is that strange? I mean, there's not much on there. Well, no, so it's... It, it's it's strange because. It's Star Wars, and I am not a massive Star Wars fan, generally speaking. Are any of us like actually like? Oh, I love Star Wars. I'm a Star. Wars, I'm a Star Wars fan. But when you say when you say you're a fan, yeah. right? Because I think I think there's there's a couple of different levels of fandom, right? Like I would say I'm a fan of Star Trek. Like I could tell you quite a lot about Star Trek. I could tell you quite a lot about the planets some of the people the way the the history of it why i'm annoyed about certain things that are canon and certain things aren't you know like that that sort of <laughs> yeah. thing yeah, right? yeah i think yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah right whereas with star wars like if if alex and alex doesn't like this about me and there's a lot to not like about me but the what this is one of them i'll like she'll be like, oh there's a new star wars thing out and i'll be like yeah that sounds fun like 
you know, I don't care like that much. Like if there's a new Ghostbusters, I'll be like, oh yeah, brilliant, yeah, cool, I'll, yeah, I'll watch that. They're they're fun movies for children. Like you know, I think it's I think it's the same for me with stuff like Star Wars, where you know I'm like, yeah, these are fun, enjoyable movies, but I'm not like I don't have any toys, I don't have any posters, I don't have a lunchbox with Star Wars on it. Like, I don't have any of that stuff. Like, well, well so, I don't have Dad, any of that. Are you a fan in that way? In the same way that you're a fan, I would say, of Football Manager. I'm. A, I'm. Hang on. I'm a. I'm a fan of Star Wars. I'm not a fanatic. And before we move on, I just want to call you on your completely unnecessary slam on Ghostbusters. There, Ghostbusters is, is not a film for kids. No, that first one. Oh my gosh, those dogs are really creepy. Ghostbusters is a classic, so I will not have you besmirching its good name. You know what, you're right. It is fun for the whole family. It's fun for everyone, yeah. So, so, yep. so you take the that back, family. Wellington. No, you know what? I, re- I retract the statement. It is not a children's movie. It is a family movie, and it is very... They are both very good. I like both the ghosts. Well, well, all the Ghostbusters I've seen are good. How many are there now? Three? Four? There are three. Three. Yeah, I've seen all three. They're all very good. So to go back to your original point, so in the same way, I know very little about Star Trek at all, really. That was never massive for me. Whereas Star Wars, I watched the originals kind of when I was young, um, because I think I think like my mom was like a a fan of them, so we had them in the house, so we'd watch them on video. I watched like the prequels were a big thing when I was young. I enjoyed them because they were they were in the same way that you're saying Ghostbusters. The prequels were kind of made for kids, especially like that first one was really it was aimed at kids. Yeah. So I did enjoy those, and then in recent years, I have really I've not watched um, Rise of Skywalker, but I did really enjoy Force Awakens. Um, I was not a massive fan of Last Jedi, which kind of means, which is the reason I haven't really kind of picked up on Rise of Skywalker. Obviously, these later movies have also coincided with me having children, where time to get to the cinema is somewhat limited. Yeah, sure. But I am. I mean, I am. I am a big fan of them. I don't. I don't own memorabilia. I don't have a Chewbacca costume hanging in my wardrobe. <laughs> sure you don't that's why you deliberately mentioned it yeah um uh, yeah but I, I i am a fan but i I'd, I'd say i'm a fan but not a fanatic football manager okay. i'd probably say i'm a fanatic because i've right, bought okay. so many okay. of those okay. games you can't say so a not. healthy fandom of star wars yeah. a healthy yeah fandom. he's got a football manager suit hanging in his yeah yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> it's just a standard suit yeah yeah um, yeah no, well well no it's not it's it's got like chewing gum in the in the pocket uh <laughs> you know and like he, Dan wears it and then just shouts orders around the house. Just there are, there's like son. scraps of paper in it with just doodles of like football tactics just stuffed in <laughs> all the football formations. Yeah. Okay, well with that being settled then, why the <laughs> why the heck, Chris, are you watching so much Star Wars stuff if you don't really So I've realised actually, because I I, I I came into Star Wars through the prequels, so I've actually watched them in chronological order essentially. Uh I realised over the last year or so of my Disney Plus subscription, that actually Star Wars for me is better on television than it is in cinemas because what I'm interested in is, what I've grown to become interested in, I should say, is the, the worlds, the lore of it, the the kind of the smaller stories that one encounters. I'm not interested in the Skywalker saga where everyone seems to be connected to this in some strange, really mm. weird way. So I've watched all of Clone Wars um, I watched all of Star Wars Rebels, and the kind of showrunner for that is uh, Dave Fiorni, who is basically like the Star Wars guru, who is in some respects um, the font of all knowledge when it comes to Star Wars. And I've moved on to The Mandalorian, and that is the brainchild of John Favreau, who, strangely enough, he'd met Dave Fiorni back when he was filming Iron Man and they were in the Skywalker Ranch, I think, mixing the sound or something when Dave Leone was working on the first season of Clone Wars and Jon Favreau had a, a voice part in it as a Mandalorian character. Oh. And then about 10 or so years later, he pitched this project for this series and they've, been, they've tried to get a live-action series on Star Wars off the ground so many years. Like I think there's like 50 scripts that have been written that have never, ever filmed. Uh, it's just never, ever happened. And... Yeah, so The Mandalorian was the one that landed. And recently, they've just announced there's going to be a few more of these live-action stories. But a bit like you, Pete, I'm not chomping at the bit to see them. I'll see them when I see them. Uh, because actually, the joy about The Mandalorian is that 
having a pre-existing knowledge of the world of Star Wars is a bit of a bonus, but it doesn't ruin it whatsoever for you because actually the joy of The Mandalorian is that it's it's just on the fringes of all that cinema stuff. And there are little subtle hints to it. Like the Force is barely mentioned, and that's kind of like a big thing apparently in Star Wars. Um, <laughs> so this, as a genre, one could call it is a bit of a space western. Mm. Um, episode about 45 minutes long. I watch it traditionally like really late at night because it is so super chilled as a series. It feels like I've just caught like a Sergio Leone film or a kind of an old school Western on at one in the morning on ITV. And it's very simple in in terms of its premise. It's set after Return of the Jedi about five years. But again, you don't really need to know that. You follow this masked bounty hunter, the Mandalorian, um, who after one job becomes the most sought after individual in the galaxy. And the Mandalorians were basically... um, this kind of gla- clan-based group of warriors, which were inclusive of a range of different species. It wasn't by species associated with one world. It was about one clan. And this huge war happened, and in the fallout of that, they've had to go into hiding. So he's basically had to earn as much money as he can. And he never takes off his helmet. It's like kind of like a kind of a badge of honor, essentially. He wears his armor. His armor is his life. And Essentially, he does jobs. He gets paid in these kind of like metal credits, which he gets melted down by an armorer who's also wearing a helmet. And that allows him to pimp up his armor a bit more. So when he walks around, people can see the value. So his entire assets are in his armor. And that's his wealth. And what it smacked of me is it feels like an RPG. Now, Mm -hmm. what I mean by that is, you know, in an RPG session, pretty much all the time, the narrative is with us. We're following it throughout everything's with us in the same way that in Mad Max, the reason why you can keep track of all those action scenes is George Miller keeps the characters slap bang in the center of the frame. Mm -hmm. You never really leave the Mandalorian. You never really stray away from him at all. There's no kind of other narratives happening on other worlds, really, across across the other end of the galaxy, like they do in the Star Wars films. It is literally just you're following this this titular character. What, what, two two questions. Uh, First of all, what's it like having a leading character who's completely in mask the whole time and also what is what's like the the sort of the structure of the the episodes because my sort of bounty hunter touchstone is cowboy bebop where where every single episode is like he goes on a different bounty (sighs) and completes it every and then and that's like the episode is like his bounty that he that that him and his other crew complete is that is that a similar thing with the mandalorian or is that yeah. more of a pretty pretty much yeah like from what and I've, I've watched all of season one and i'm a bit of the way through season two this this isn't about kind of world building or anything like that and you can what i love is you can sum up up each episode in one sentence for example the mandalorian joins forces with another bounty hunter is betrayed and manages to defeat them that is the episode <laughs> literally 45 minutes <laughs> okay. but 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 like but what I like is because Star Wars is so Star Wars is a space opera. Sure. It's it's showy, it's dramatic, it's over the top. Having this guy in a mask, played by excellently by Pedro Pascal, very understated performance, but yet he conveys so much of just a tilt of his head. You can see what he's emoting there. Mm. It's not trying to be showy. It is very unassumed. It is very quiet. It is very gritty, yeah. and it's just engaging to watch. I can't explain it. That's why watching it at like very late at night. It's just so super chilled. And it's it means really that when focused. drama happens, it's great. Yeah. It is very focused. And yeah. when action happens, it's like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And so every episode is like him going to a new world. He's basically trying to earn money. And without spoiling it, as I said, there's that one job where everything changes. But even everyone so... Everyone knows. He... Everyone knows, Chris. Okay, everyone yeah. Knows. So even so, like... Um, he still has to he still has to earn money and do but it's yeah. one job to another job to another job you know it never cuts the chase he's having to slowly but surely get to where he wants to get like the episode i've watched today he turns up on a planet looking for another mandalorian somebody else is wearing this armor as a, as a debt as a fo- uh, as a point of honor he says look no one can wear the armor i want that armor and the bloke says well to get this armor like an rpg you need to help me kill this massive monster that's plaguing this whole town and that's the episode mm-hmm. and, and it is just great it's similar to the witcher actually the witcher series is quite is sort of formed in and and definitely the cer- certain the and certainly the early witcher books are kind of like that short story of Geralt turns up takes a contract and you know 
completes it. But like, what's really quite cool as well is that like the music it, that needs to be kind of really talked about because you haven't got the beautiful lush sweeping um, uh, melodies of John Williams. This is Ludwig Göransson, who I believe did the music for Black Panther, and he was really working very hard to find a distinctive sound for this, which is like you know the kind of like Sergio Leone kind of Italian Western kind of spaghetti Western sound. You know, we all know the you know the, the, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But imagine that in a kind of sci-fi setting. Really, really cool. The music just gently kind of breathes in and breathes out. You're not hit over the head with these very dense light motifs, which I love. They're very lush. They're beautiful, but they do not fit in this at all. And it just, it's just, it's just breathes gently. It's not dramatic. It's not over the top. It's not intense, really. But it's not very boring. It's really genuinely engaging, very interesting, like those great Sergio Leone westerns where you've got these expansive landscapes. And it's incredible that it's expansive given the fact that all of this is filmed on a set in a very unique set, um, Stagecraft, which is basically these large LED screens. And um, Disney teamed up with Epic Games and their Unreal Engine to basically, and they've got this huge kind of um, set of screens that is like 21 feet tall, just of LCD screens, and 75 feet in diameter. And what they can do is they can render these photorealistic environments in real time. But the really cool thing is, and it's worth watching the making of this, even if you're never going to watch the series, because it's just an incredible leap forward in filmmaking, mm -hmm. is that if, a, if a, the parallax effect is retained. So if, for example, Pete is in front of the camera mm -hmm. and the camera moves around Pete, like it moves at a different speed around Pete, if that makes sense, compared to the background yeah. moving in the background, this moves with the camera, the background. And it, you, you do think you're outside when you're watching it. It's hard to believe that this all took place on a soundstage. They went off and did location scouting, but rather than taking the actors to the locations like Iceland and stuff in the desert, they brought everything indoors to the studio. And it is phenomenal to watch, like just loading a scene and the lighting and everything. And just the, the, the scene, suddenly you're outside and it's, just, it's a bit like the holodeck in Star Trek. Yeah. Right. Uh, hands across the ocean there. If you're not a fan of Star Wars, watch it because you don't you're not missing anything if you've not watched Star Wars before at all. It is yeah. it is generally worth a watch and and I'm just meeting out my portions of it really because it is just so super chilled. If you could pick a day in history to go back to to witness an event, right? What day would you pick? And here is the caveat you will come back with the knowledge and you can share that knowledge with anyone you want, but they will never, ever believe you. What's annoying about this is I know there's a really good answer that I'm not going to be able to think of, but I know there is well, a really I, good answer I, that I could give. Shall I tell you mine? Shall I tell you mine? So mine is 1969, man lands on moon, NASA uh, headquarters in Cape Canaveral. Just be, I, I think, I feel like, being able to witness that as it happened would be a very incredible and humbling moment. And I don't think in human history there's anything that's really come close to that in, in terms of like how momentous and uh, groundbreaking it was as a piece of human achievement. So you could go back to Texas, Dallas, see yeah. JFK get shot, find out the truth, but no one's ever going to believe you. Well, mm. so, I want kind of, I think maybe an event of kind of like a joyful event where kind of like the, the ending of World War Two, the kind of the, the parties that people came out into the streets and that sense of uplifting kind of that joyful nature of it, it's over. That kind of just to experience that, I think, would be would be something that would be I wouldn't have to worry about like the curse of knowledge and stuff like that, because it's not like. I, the war was still running. This war would have been over. That would have been the the big thing that would have been hanging over it. So I think that's that's where I would probably come in at. Just something to experience, an incredibly happy thing shared by everyone, or the World Cup final where England won. That's also a very good one. I mean, it's a very similar thing, but it's just a bit more concentrated. Actually, or actually, I mean, this is I'm I'm really narrowing it down now to being just about me. Um, maybe when Aston Villa won the European Cup in 1982. Because my dad was there, I could sit. I could sit with my dad and watch it. Yeah, there we go. That's what. Yeah, I but what, do. Have, what have you found out? Something though, you saw your dad. You know, he, he. What you know, you found out he wasn't really a Villa fan. He was like he was on the other, the other, the away team. I mean, I he's know. not German, so. 
<laughs> or, or, or he he takes a sip. He takes a sip of like an ice cold beer and goes, "Why do I drink these?" <laughs> he's like, he's like "Ugh." <laughs> um, well, as someone who doesn't like beer, I would never feel closer to my dad then. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, that, yeah but he'll good, never believe it? you. He'll never believe you. Yeah, you'll exactly. go to him and go, like, "Dad, no, no, I know no, you well. don't like beer," and he'd be like, "Don't." Don't don't kid about Mike. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? He's not Australian that, either. That was perhaps the least accurate impression I've ever heard. But um, he's a very well-travelled man, isn't he? Your dad? Yeah, he is. apparently so. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. I would go back to go and see the uh, just a, an average day. Yeah. In okay. the life of the third great civilization of Earth. And I would ask them, what are your names? Because nobody knows. They were one of the biggest civilizations, you know, around that period of time. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, just before, maybe just after the Mesopotamians. And um, we have written record that they existed because we have knowledge of p other people talking about them. We had no people traded with them. We, we even have a couple of artifacts of theirs, but we don't have any information as to what they are called. They were called nicknames by other people. Um, and, but we just don't know what they refer to themselves as. So I would go up to them and I'd be like, what are you called? And it'd probably be something like really weird, but like, or like really interesting. I don't know. But I'd love to go and do that. Go and have a look what they're like. Apparently they're out in like the mud plains around the sort of like Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran regions. Just go and see what life's like. It'd be like, oh man, this is hard. But I only have to be here for like a day, so it's fine. But that's the thing, Pete. You'd, you'd have found out kind of really interesting information mm. that people would want to know about, but no yeah. one would believe you. Yeah, but that's fine. I'll take it to my grave. It's all right. I don't care. Well, I'm knowing so that they're all called Jim. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah the Jim, the Jimalization. The like, I, I, like, I'd be like absolutely fine with that. People would go, oh, he's mad. He, he's got no idea. But I would go to the grave knowing. And ha that'd be really fun for me. It's like a secret. You know, when somebody tells you a secret and you're like, and then you, it's really fun that you know the secret. But what if that knowledge was like the last bit of a puzzle to unlocking some famous cure? Okay. Or well, some, yeah, uh, but it's, yeah, but it's not. In this instance, it's not. It's the name of a civilization. It's like, it might be. Trivial. Like, if only we knew their names. In your scenario, Pete, it's not that you're telling people they're not believing you. You're not telling anyone. So you're not yeah, sharing I'm not this information. <laughs> yeah, so you're no, getting I'm, this information just anyway. for you. Well, they're not going to believe me. What's the point? You will want to tell people, and it will annoy no, you wouldn't. that they don't believe you. No, because I'm like, I'd, I'd be like, I'd be like, it's called this. I don't believe you. All right, I'll go, I'll go to, I'll go to the grave with the jimalization knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I just got this vision of like Pete just sat at, sat like alone in a house, surrounded by piles of newspapers. Like they'll never yeah, believe yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, his, his his final words on his deathbed is that they were all called Jim. They were all called Jim. <laughs> it's like the ending of Citizen Kane. <laughs> I mean, how do you top that? I mean, yeah, I was going to say who's Jack the Ripper, but you know, oh, Jack the Ripper's a good one. Who's Jack the Ripper? That's quite a good one for me. I, Atlantis. I'd like to know if that existed. I suppose I would like to. Yeah, a bit like what Sam was saying, actually. A moon landing was my first one, really. I would like to, and this is a kind of a geeky thing, I'd love to be in the room when, to find out, okay, once and for all, in terms of, like, the relationship between Bob Kane and Bill Finger, how Batman was created. Oh, I'd love one. to be in the room and seeing those ideas bouncing off one. each other and how this figure, this this kind of, this drawing, inspired by Leonardo da Vinci's drawings, would become this huge titular character that is known throughout the globe so sam in this scenario are are we actually present or are we just kind of overlooking because is it a situation where kind of they're creating batman and chris is sat in the corner just kind of pretending <laughs> hiding behind like a, a curtain or something yeah yeah it's, it's fly on the wall you can't affect okay, anything yeah. that's happening you're just it's like you're the just, watchers in the marvel just, universe so it's not a kind of thing of like chris goes back finds out about batman then comes back to the comes back to present and like batman doesn't exist and replaced by i don't know rat thing or he does or he does but just looks like chris yeah yeah it's just it's just a story of a child and his parents had a lovely night at the opera <laughs> i i finally had to peter willington and uh chris darby mm -hmm. 
I had to boost my Switch internal memory. I had to spend some dollary dues mm-hmm. to get some more bytes for my Switch. Okay. Because I've bought too many games. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how big how, how big an increase are we talking, Sammy? That's not too rude a question to well, ask. How many gigs have you got now? So what I had a one two eight gigabyte and I'm at two five six. Oh that's nice. Yeah. So I I kind of went through a period of buying lots of stuff because it was kind of cheap and on sale. Um so I got um the Bioshock collection, which is what sort of tipped me tipped like my storage, internal storage over the edge. Because mm-hmm. essentially even though it comes in a box and a card, all yeah. that is is you know, there's about like two gigabytes on the uh, cartridge and then everything else you just have to download. Have from you the played store. any of it, Sam? Nope. Good. Uh, well, well <laughs> two thirds two thirds of that collection is very good. I mean, I mean, a large part of my Switch internal memory is taken up from the 25 gigabytes that is XCOM 2. <laughs> um, uh, well, what else did I buy? I got, um, I also got uh, Murder by Numbers which um murder by is numbers a, murder by numbers which is a uh, a phoenix wright uh adventure style adventure but powered by the puzzles of nonograms or pit cross um <laughs> <laughs> oh no you you now you sent us some pictures of this asking us to guess what it was that you had drawn and it looked nothing like what we thought it was i know yeah it's it's incredible like i got for the reasons that will come apparent in 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 this, in this very short while i had to buy a uh, nintendo online and so i thought i'm buying it so i'm gonna get something for my money so i started playing <laughs> Uh, the Japanese Mario Pit Cross because um, I've never really played Pit Cross before, and then I, I got re- I got super into it. I was like, yeah. "This is my this is like deductive reasoning is like the puzzles that I am into." Brilliant. Like is why Chris really hated when we played Break the Code because I was like there in a couple of steps and he was you know still struggling. Um, but like like things like things like cryptid like whitehall like puzzles where you have to figure out well they can't be there because of x y and z but they can be here because of a b c like that is my jam so murder by numbers are a bunch of pit cross puzzles but you're also solving murders <laughs> um, <laughs> um so yes that's been fun but what i also got recently was Need for Speed Hot Pursuit. Yes, yes, Remastered. Yes. Oh. Because that's like... One of the things I tried to do with my Switch is generally try to curate a collection of games that in some sort of apocalyptic or some sort of like hunker down isolationist scenario, mm. I've got everything I need. So, you know, I've got The Witcher. I've got my massive RPG. I've got my puzzle games. I've got my strategical turn-based in, in, a, in a shocking turn of events, you now have Minecraft on there. I also got Minecraft, so I've got my infinitely chill sort of crafting game. I also got Thronebreaker, the you know the Gwent-based Witcher. Is that any good card game? It's re- it's really good, hmm. um, yeah. mainly because and I didn't realise this going in is that because I, I thought it would just be like random games of Gwent with people in the Witcher world, but actually what it mostly is is Pete will know this more than more than anyone else it's a bit like might and magic where yep. you will approach a situation and it'll be like defeat this enemy under these conditions yep you've got one turn yeah and it'll be like you've got access to this card this card and this card you've got to defeat this enemy who's got this this and this in three turns that's cool and i, I do enjoy like vanilla gwent but it makes it such more of an interesting prospect and the actual story that they've got on in top of on top of Thronebreaker is fitting of the Witcher world, shall I say? It's not just a sort of window dressing around the game of Gwent. It's actually quite a deep and rich mm-hmm. experience. But yes, but yes, Need for Speed Hot Pursuit was kind of one of the missing things where I was looking for a good racing game because yeah. I got Burnout Burnout Paradise Remastered, and that was okay. But I think it just lacked that structure. Like it's very, very open world, and like there are two it's... camps. 
There are two okay. camps. There are the Burnout Paradise camp. Yeah. And there are the Burnout 3 camp. Okay. And the Burnout Paradise camp are, bless them, misguided. Because they feel <laughs> like... Uh, so, so what I think what they what they enjoy and uh, games like Need for Speed Most Wanted and stuff like that. I think there's a, there's there is fun in that open world. Go and go anywhere, do anything, use yeah. your car for fun, right? Like, yeah. but like to complete objectives. And then there's the Need for Speed uh, Hot Pursuit and the Burnout Three, which is kind of a, an offshoot of the kind of games like outrun where it's like here's a track like here's a definitive thing that you're going to race on and like a proper race structure as you say and i'm definitely much more in that camp of like i want i want games that have direction and i mean that in 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 the way of like a director would provide direction well it's, it's like for example in um burnout paradise you kind of drive around this this city and the idea is that you have to rev at traffic lights or stop at traffic lights to choose the kind of thing that you want to do whether you want to do a race or a time trial or or whatever so it's it's kind of the the video game of equivalent of scrolling through netflix trying to decide what you really want to do yeah. next um you just spend all your time driving around going well i'm not really in the mood for a race and then you drive around you just go well, i'm not really in the mood for a stunt thing i'll yeah. carry on and you just end up just doing nothing you just end up just driving around yeah. and then the other issue that i had with burnout paradise is that once you get into a race it's up to you how you complete that race it's not like the whole city shuts down there's only one path you can take from start yeah. to finish it's you can take any route that you want to get to the finish line and even though that is slightly liberating more often than not i felt that i was just making the wrong choices yep. and the wrong turns yep. and getting punished for not knowing yep. the city inside out yep. so when i sort of started playing need for speed hot pursuit remastered i remembered how much of a joy it is to kind of sit down and have in front of you almost like a chapter list of events and different races and then when you go into those races it's like here's a start point here's an end point go here is nearly 100 races they are on some really interesting courses they've been mm -hmm. beautifully designed and hat and they've been crafted so there is an open world you can drop the car anywhere and just drive anywhere you like but there's none of that like you, there's no real sort of reason to do it other than to just enjoy it go for a drive and stuff like that yeah but each of them is 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 crafted a bunch of really amazingly beautiful cars that yeah. are really fun to drive and 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 quite often feel there are there are some differences i think like some real diff fundamental differences between the vehicles which i think is good for an arcade racer and lots of really fun modes as well between the two being a racer and being a cop yeah that's that that's kind of like the big the big selling point in the game is that you can either be a racer like just speeding and breaking all the laws and dodging cars or you can be a cop like charged with taking down the ne'er do wells on the on the street and like i think that provides such a nice sort of like light like it provides such a nice like light and dark shading yep. to the game yep. like again it makes it so easy for me to jump into a race because i kind of feel like do i want to listen to 30 seconds to mars and pendulum whilst i'm like pelting down the road whilst like there's light there's a lightning storm going on trying to beat my time yeah. or do i want to listen to this orchestral fast and furious score while i'm the cops trying to like take down these these um these races on the street like it makes it super easy to kind of decide where i'm going to jump in and where i'm going to have that sort of like piecemeal experience with a game which on this which especially on the switch is kind of like those are the experience i've got 20 minutes i'm hopping on my switch i'm going to do like i'm going to do a cop mission and like even i think mechanically as well like you know thematically this light dark element i think it is represented really well mechanically as well yes in the uh the two races i i think are really smart are for the cops it's rapid response which is yeah. essentially a time trial except for anything you hit gives you a time penalty mm -hmm. so you are actually really actively rewarded for thinking about other road users like absolutely hammering it but doing it in a <laughs> but doing it in as responsible a method as you can 
Like, yes. And it really feels like because those penalties are really significant, and like you will not meddle if you're if you're you know reckless and all over the road. And for me, the the one that the racers have that I think is really good is is the hot pursuit mode where there is it does feel like there is this honor among thieves whereby you're actively racing against other racers while the cops race uh, try and take you down and so i always felt bad about using my because there are also a couple of different like weapons that you can use like uh, um like road spikes or uh, an emp or uh, you can bring in a helicopter if you're the cops you know things like that I always felt really bad and there wasn't really anything massive to be gained from using it against fellow racers. Whereas whenever I saw somebody take a cop out or I took a cop out, I always felt like, yeah, I'm I'm part of this fun racing yeah, yeah. gang. And like, we're just careening through the thing. We don't care if we're knocking into people, having such a great time. It feels really like thematic mechanically in that way, which I think a lot of racing games don't really bother with. Yeah, I think I mean we played we played Hot Pursuit kind of way back when when it when it first came out. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. and we kind of I think we I mean we've all been playing kind of we we especially like co-op games. I mean obviously with the racing you're a bit more competitive, but we've been playing games together for many many years. And I think we'd all agree there are probably just a handful of games that really stand out as to being those those top class experiences. And yep. Need for Speed Hot Pursuits in particular was one of those games. It's the only racing <laughs> game really that we've kept going back to we we've we've dabbled with trackmania uh we we never all got together with something like a mario kart um but hot pursuit was definitely something we, we kind of all enjoyed i mean i i remember playing like us playing online against other people which is something we never do and i remember yeah. distinctly a race where for whatever reason like hell froze over and i was the only guy left and i was, was darting so to the finish line with you guys cheering me on and we go, what yeah. the hell? Because all the other, all the opposition was chasing me down, and I was like, what is going on? I think I lost probably, but anyway, moving on. <laughs> so yeah, so when this this kind of came out, um, Pete, you were very excited by this. Um, oh man! And you you kind of you mentioned you mentioned it just numerous times, and obviously you then purchased it, and I think um, me and Sam, I'm not sure, Chris, if you've partaken yet. So yeah, so we we kind of jumped on that bandwagon as well, and I kind of loaded it up, and I. I got it all in sword and I got ready to play it and I played one or two races. Oh, and then I sort of, it, it all linked up. So Pete was there and Sam was there. So I thought, I'll have a go at this. And I tried to beat some of their times. And it was at that point that I remembered, oh yeah, you're not very good at this game, are you? And I was like, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I, oh, no. I remembered all that kind of that excitement of kind of playing it. But I'd completely mm. forgotten that I'm just not very good. I just, I crash all the time because because I'm really aggressive and I want to kind of get the best time, but I make silly mistakes every time. I think the thing that I was, I was reminded of with that game as well is well, two things actually. One, as I say, I think the, 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 I always, my, some of my favorite games are the games where they are able to like really play with your play with exactly how they want you to emotionally feel at a certain point so uh, this is a really small thing it's gonna sound really dorky but i think it is the best intro of any racing game and all it is is a title screen with a couple of credits but the way that they the way that they intro it the music that they use the lighting that they have it's so 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 exciting to just get to the title screen and you're like oh my goodness this is going to be really exciting i and i think throughout the rest of the game they they're really good at like emotionally like whoever it was that was directing it i think alex ward was still at um criterion when they were doing it i think and the the way that uh, you know the director manages to frames a bunch of the animated shots of you uh spinning the cop car around heading in the different direction to go to get quickly to the to the space or um like the race is like honing it across the desert like like it makes you feel really really excited and the other thing that i was really excited for and this touches on what you were talking about dan i've forgotten how forward thinking that game is like that game had a mobile app with a a, and within the game itself like a constant online leaderboard that was continually updating and constantly get trying to get you back into the game to beat your friends like there is the way that it it acts is much more like one of the more like live services that we're much more used to now with mobile and free to play and all that sort of stuff much more along the lines of like a rocket league or don't starve or 
one of these games that just keeps you coming back all the time. It was really forward thinking at the time because the speed wall is just... I am constantly looking at that. There are two different locations in the game that are, that basically say you are not as fast as your friends. You need yeah. to, you need to play this because because they're you know so and so three beat seconds you. behind. Yeah, mm-hmm. this person beat you. <laughs> yeah, and then we and then if you do it and you say you you I finish and I finish like two seconds behind you, it'll say Pete is still faster than you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the language it uses. It's it's a case of oh just just oh. Oh, get the knife in there. It is. It is genuinely, it was a, a, a really special game. And like, it, yeah, it, it really surprised me how modern it felt. And it's not a, it's not even a particularly, um, it's not a particularly like deluxe remaster or anything like that. No. It's, it's, you know, this, you know, they added in all the DLC that they had and, and it's, and it's really good. As I say, there's nearly a hundred races. There's a whole bunch of different cars, but there isn't a huge amount of stuff. And I know the Switch and the base PS4 version runs at 30, basically runs at 30 frames and it's fine. Like it, like it runs really well on a base PS4. Like I, I didn't have a single hitch. I thought it was really, really good. But I do also know that if you've got like a Pro or a PS5, it'll hit 60 frames and I would love to play that game at 60 frames a second. Like, ah, oh, like beautiful looking thing. In 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 like a world of um, everything being remade and remastered, like perfect choice. If you think that we've had like you know Shadow of the Colossus remaster, Last of um, Us, Demon Souls, Last of Us remastered. What else? Crash Bandicoot, Spyro. Spyro. Like it's the only one of the remasters that I've played that I've genuinely felt nostalgic playing that was another episode of staying in with peter willington daniel frost sam turner and myself chris darby happy new year i know it feels like it's been a decade or so since the last one began but here we are thanks to you who have stayed with us throughout and welcome to those who have just joined us and have stayed to the end of the episode Can I just say a special shout out to Birdwood Games for kindly putting us in their top five board gaming podcasts of 2020. If you have come here looking for board game stuff, then apologies for all the video gaming content this episode. Feel free to dip into our back catalogue at stayinginpodcast.com or visit our Board Game Geek page, which lists everything we have covered and where to find it. Feel free to say hello to us via social media feeds at stayinginpod or drop us an email at stayinginpod at gmail.com. I've got a good feeling about 2021. The fact that no one from the future has turned up yet to learn the answer to a great mystery is, I suppose, a good thing. Till next time, bye!